These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Today, we're picking up our story right where we left off. Arabi is a young farmer who recently moved to a new field where he planted barley and struggled through his first winter. His wife, Ilsha Hagalu, cares for their three-year-old son, Ayabani, and their newborn daughter, Warad Aya. As a reminder, if you haven't listened to the last two episodes, all these people are fictional. My goal in this series is to give a condensed version of a lot of fairly dry material on domestic industry and daily life, and give it a more personal touch by looking at what these environments and conditions could have looked like for a single generic ancient Mesopotamian. So just bear in mind that while the things this family does and experiences are based on, I hope, a good bit of research, the people themselves are just illustrations of what could have been. As we saw at the end of the last episode, what could have been was a miserable and hungry end to our young family. Starving through the winter was more likely when times were hard for a whole region, and there was no one at all to beg or borrow from. But even in good times, it could happen. And even to families a few rungs up from the very bottom of society. In Arabi's case, he had the option of taking out loans or going hat-in-hand to his family. But they avoided that out of pride and hope that things would get better. Many stuck in a similar situation would just mortgage their future, take out a loan on the coming harvest, and then get stuck in a cycle of debt that kept them from being able to invest in their own land. Others would toss out their pride and fall to begging or theft. But we know from many poor countries nowadays, where people live in subsistence agriculture not too terribly far removed from A or B's situation, that sometimes people are killed by a mix of unbending pride and bad luck. Sometimes they take the gamble that A or B took and it doesn't pay off. The crop could have failed. The reserves could have gotten infested by rats or bugs. The starvation rations could have caused illness. And for subsistence farmers living so much closer to the edge than any modern folk do nowadays, at least in the West, When one thing goes wrong, it often serves as the catalyst for many other disasters, one after another. Arabi ponders on this as he completes the harvest, remembering an old proverb, the number of unhappy days is endless, yet life is better than death. The first month of the year is nearly over. The date is about early May in the modern calendar, and all the barley has been collected near the house for processing. Looking out over his harvested field, Arabi sees a hungry woman with a ten-year-old child walking through his field, picking through the fallen stalks, looking for grains that Arabi may have missed during the harvest. The woman is probably a poor widow, with no one to take care of her, and very few options for employment now that she's aged out of prostitution. Though there is bread in Arabi's belly now, he understands her and leaves her be. Gleaning, the practice of poor people picking through harvested fields for scraps, is as old as anything Arabi knows. And while legal protections for gleaning are different in different places, ultimately it comes down to the field owner either allowing it or chasing them off. The gleaners, in turn, know not to touch anything harvested or bundled up, and not to take from the field before the harvest, or they then turn very quickly from pitiable victims to despised thieves and rodents. Arabi has more important concerns than gleaners, though. He has a large pile of wheat, the produce from six iku of land, about two and a half hectares in modern terms. And on this virgin soil, the harvest was spectacular. He estimates that after processing, he'll have somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 liters of barley. An adult wants six to eight hundred liters for the year to eat, 
though in a good year, a portion of that will be traded away for other foods. The three-year-old can maybe eat like half that, and the newborn is still on milk provided for by her mother. All told, A or B is looking at a surplus of maybe 1,500 to 2,000 liters after the family's been given enough to eat, plus the extra 200 set aside for seeding the next year and hiring plows. The idea of currency is alien to A or B, but a bag of barley in the market is as good as a dollar bill in modern America. Those precious grains are still locked inside the stalks, though. A or B doesn't know this, but in ancient times, those grains were locked more firmly than they are in his era. It's through selective breeding, both intentional and unintentional, that more easily shattering husks have evolved. Also, the heads are bigger than they were in ancient times, with both more per seed, uh, more seeds per plant, and larger, more nutritious seeds. Still, even if things are better for him than they were, there's a lot of work ahead of him. First up, his pile of grain needs to be threshed. There are multiple ways threshing can be done, and looking out over the other fields, he sees men with oxen and donkeys walking over the grain pile all day, while others have the animals carrying sledges, basically just a heavy sled with spikes on the bottom that separate the edible parts from the rest of the plant. Next year, ARB resolves to hire one of these animals to help with the process. The low-tech way is to manually beat the pile of plants. Ilsha Hagalu has already started doing this by hand to get enough grain to feed them each day during the harvest. But now, ARB grabs his agricultural flail and begins to beat the grain pile in earnest. Once the pile has been beaten for hours and hours, he switches flail for hoe and begins to winnow the pile. In some parts of the world, they use a cloth screen to filter the chaff from the wheat. But here, ARB uses wind and gravity to help sort the good from the bad. He takes his trusty hoe and flings a bunch of barley up into the air, oriented with the wind. The grains fall back to the dirt quickly, while the much lighter chaff gets blown away into his field. The grain pile builds up quickly, and Ilshihagalu begins scooping it up into jars, where it'll be stored for most of the year in the house. The family is now well into the second month of the year, late May or early June, and the heat is really starting to be felt. But they pay it little mind. The harvest was fantastic this year. They actually ran out of grain jars and needed to purchase more just to store it all. They got nearly 700 silla, or about 700 liters, of grain per iku of land, a bit short of 2,000 liters per hectare. The family thanks Ea, their household god, and they thank Era, the god of their fathers. The family thanks Nisaba for the harvest and Enbilulu for the waters of the Euphrates and Tigris. They thank the god of their city. They thank the high gods. They thank all the gods as a whole, offering to each of these a portion of their grain at a small nearby temple. The family then celebrates at the market, spending their fresh grain for meat, vegetables, beer, and other small treats and then spend the afternoon at home in a tiny feast. The great struggle of the winter has finally ended, and if the gods were merciful, it did not look like there would be a repeat of that again this year. Barley grain alone is the foundation of Eirebi's life. If he wanted, he could rest for much of the summer, until it was time to prepare and plant his field once again a task which is considerably easier when the field has been worked the year before. But Arabi is cleverer than that. He knows that barley is common, and if he wants to really better his situation, he needs to transform it into something slightly less common, something which everyone loves. Arabi wants to turn his entire agricultural surplus this year into beer 
some for drinking, and most for selling at a slightly higher price than the grain itself would fetch. Ilsha Hagalu, meanwhile, has her hands full inside the house. The infant, like all human infants, can do nothing on its own, needs to be fed eight times a day, including into the night, and makes messes about as often, sometimes with the poop coming out while the baby is still drinking milk in. This is Ilsha Hagalu's second child, so she's used to that sort of thing, but that doesn't make it any less all-consuming and exhausting. Meanwhile, their three-year-old boy, Aya Bani, is running around everywhere and has mastered the Akkadian word la, or no, and has taken to rebelling against his parents with an utter indifference to spankings. In between all that, she needs to find time to feed the household each day. The grain in the jars will not last forever on its own. Each day during the early summer, she needs to empty an entire jar and roast some of the grains. She props a wide, flat stone up above a fire, fueled by chaff in this season and dung in later seasons, and places the grains on the stone where they dry roast. These roasted grains are then put back into the jar, where they will last for a year or longer. These roasted barley grains can be eaten as is, or they can be put in a bit of water or milk and boiled to make porridge, which is what the family eats most days. It'll take her two weeks to roast about a third of the barley, but it's important that she does to have a long-term food supply safe from spoilage. This will be their stores for the latter half of the year. And even if next year's harvest is poor, then it's going to need to stretch even further. Today, Ilsha Hagalu is going to make bread. Her first stop in the morning is the village market, where among other things, she buys a small bundle of reeds for a pittance, a small sack of barley. She takes these reeds home and carefully peels the individual reeds lengthwise so that she gets a large number of very thin strands. The thicker of these strands she spins by hand and ties into a sturdy circular frame. The thinner weaves she weaves inside the frame, creating a reed sieve. She had one before, but they never last very long, and if the family's going to be making a lot of beer this year, then they're going to need a lot of bread. And a lot of bread needs a lot of sieves. She draws a measure of barley out from the jar and places it first in her stone mortar. The grain mortar is a massive chunk of limestone carved into a very rough, deep bowl shape with a fist-sized stone stick called a pestle to go along with it. Smashing the grain in the mortar with the pestle produces flour and the more she grinds, the finer the flour gets, producing a higher quality final product. She isn't too interested in super high quality flour though, and makes what's called coarse barley flour. After milling, she puts it in her new reed sieve and lets the bran separate from the germ. The bran will be sold to her neighbors as animal feed. The rest is now the flour. Next, Ilsha Hagalu takes the empty jar and carries it to the canal, thankful that it's not too far from the house, and fills it with water to carry home. The water and flour are mixed to a consistency that she learned from her mother while she was still a young girl, and which she's rehearsed through a lifetime of bread making, and will someday teach to her own daughter. Half of this dough gets put in a shelf in the shade. They have no sour with which to start a leavened bread, so today's bread will all be unleavened, so-called ash cake. The dough will sit on the shelf for three days, and if the gods will it, then a new form of material will appear upon the dough, the leaven, which will allow it to rise. If the gods are angry, then the dough might spoil instead, but the process of allowing atmospheric yeast to settle on the dough while not understood in quite those terms, is known well enough to be reliable when no mother bread is available. The leavened bread is by far the family's favorite. 
She has the option of putting in figs and dates, or oil, butter, garlic, onion, animal fat, and spices to make it into... Like it's translated as a cake, but of course they have no eggs to make it rise like a modern cake, but a pastry. And the, But the process will be pretty much the same either way. She's going to take the dough that now has leaven, either from the atmosphere or directly added from a piece of mother bread, mix it thoroughly with whatever flavoring she can get her hand on, then stick it either in an oven or on top of a hot, flat stone. There are no eggs, and it does appear that milk was used only very rarely in baking. Still, besides that, a wide variety of pastries and baked goods, both sweet and wholesome, are possible. But not for her. They're still poor. Probably none of that until at least next year's harvest. But if leavened bread is off the table, then unleavened bread will have to do. Fortunately, Unleavened bread is much simpler, and she could even make it from the roasted grain if all the fresh grain is gone. She just takes the simple dough, pats it into a pancake shape, and puts it directly on the hot coals of the hearth, then covers them with hot ash to heat both sides at once. It only takes a few minutes for the unleavened bread to be ready, then she pulls it out, wipes off the ash, and lets it cool. This latter method has been in use for millennia, invented by her far-distant ancestors, and will remain in common use even thousands of years after Ilsha Higalu's own time among her far-distant descendants. Though it's hard to tell with so many centuries separating the modern listener from the ancient housewife, it seems that the majority of meals eaten in the home among the majority of families would have been the roasted grain, typically the roasted barley grain, either by itself or in porridge or gruel. Among the breads, the most common would be the unleavened breads, and these would be especially convenient to eat while on the move, either as a working lunch in the fields or while traveling, or while working for the government as a laborer or soldier. Made typically from the cheapest, coarsest ground barley flour, it would have been thick, rough, dry, likely quite crumbly depending on exactly how it was cooked, and of course coated by a light layer of ash, as only most would get brushed off before eating. Hunger and familiarity would make this a sort of comfort food, but even for people with far less variety than we can imagine nowadays, it does seem that the barley porridge and unleavened barley bread was not romanticized in quite the same way that Egyptians celebrated their wheat breads or East Asians celebrate rice. Her husband, Ayarabi, comes in for the evening, sweating after a long day outside. His whole personality has returned to the charming normal that she's used to now that things are going well for the family. He sees his young son, Ayabani, and asks if the three-year-old wants to help unload the donkey. There isn't much the child can do, but he is eager to help his father with adult work, and rushes out into the coming evening gloom. Ilsha Higalu stands and smiles as she goes over into a corner and cleans out a few possessions that they have to make space for the delivery. A or B begins to bring in, one by one, three clay jars each about belly button height, narrower than a woman's hips, and extremely narrow, almost pointed at the bottom. These were pricey, but they'll last an extremely long time, and are an investment in the family's future. The shape of this jar is as recognizable to any Mesopotamian as a classic pint mug is to an Englishman, as is a physical symbol of beer the divine liquid given to men by the gods. These come with three very solid stands and a hole at the bottom, currently plugged with a wooden wedge. Beside these, more tall jars are brought in, these with much more normal bases that can stand on their own, and flared tops for easier transport when full. It's into these jars that the finished product will be poured, and out of these jars, it'll be sold and consumed. 
Once everything has been brought inside, the family can enjoy a dinner of barley porridge and go to bed to dream sweet visions of beer to come. The next morning, Ilsha Hagalu awakens before her husband. The new jars need to be brought one by one to the canal, and Ilsha Hagalu thanks her family god as she carries each one that they live so close to a water source. First, the jars must be washed. Arabi could not afford new jars, just used ones, and they need to be scrubbed well with a wet cloth to get the residue out. That said, even if they had been new, they should still be washed before using. Jars, both new and used, can develop flavors that attach to the beer. Sometimes this is desirable, but not this time. As she scrubs, she sings the hymn to Ninkasi, a devotional prayer to the goddess of beer. Given birth by the flowing water, tenderly cared for by Ninhursag, Ninkasi, given birth by the flowing water, tenderly cared for by Ninhursag. Having founded your town upon wax, she completed its great walls for you, Ninkasi. Your father is Enki, Lord Nudimud, and your mother is Ninti, the queen of the Abzu. Ninkasi, it is you who handle the ingredients and dough with a big shovel, mixing in a pit the beer bread with sweet aromatics. Ninkasi, it is you who bake the beer bread in the big oven and put in order the piles of hulled grain. Ninkasi, it is you who waters the earth-covered malt. The noble guard, the noble dogs guard it even from the potentates, that is to say the rats and other pests. Ninkasi, it is you who soak the malt in a jar. The waves rise, the waves fall. Ninkasi, it is you who spread the cooked mash on large reed mats. Coolness overcomes it. Ninkasi, it is you who holds with both hands the great sweet wort, brewing it with honey and wine. Ninkasi, you add the sweet wort to the vessel. Ninkasi, you place the fermenting vat, which makes a pleasant sound appropriately on top of the large collector vat. Ninkasi, it is you who pour out the filtered beer of the collector vat. It is like the onrush of the Tigris and the Euphrates. The song, which admittedly lose a, loses a bit when you're out of Akkadian and in English, is a devotion to the goddess, but it's also a memory device to ensure that she recalls each step, one that goes back to the days of the Sumerians. The song is not by itself a recipe. Many sing the same hymn and get different results. Instead, each line recalls to her mind her mother explaining certain details at each step so she can learn the way her family does things. The basic outline can be filled out in many ways, and Ilsha Galu's family tradition is, in her mind, one of the best ways to make beer in all of Mesopotamia. When she's finished cleaning the pots, she fills some of them with water and brings them all back to the house. By the time she arrives, her husband Eirabi has finished digging a big pit in the yard with his trusty hoe. The dirt around it has been packed tight to make a solid basin, and she'll let the pit sit for a day. Meanwhile, she has a number of scoops of fresh barley grain out of a jar and places them on the ground covering the floor one layer thick in the back room of their small house. She takes one of her water jars and splashes it all over the seeds, being careful not to damage the unprotected walls of their mud house. This is one of Ninkasi's many miracles. By allowing the seed to begin sprouting, the barley transforms from a starch to a sugar. Each day she will re-water the seeds and will stir the room a few times each day to make sure that the whole seed gets rotated around and everything gets a chance to malt. It will take two or three days for the tiny sprout to poke out, indicating that the malt is prepared. In the meantime, she'll take some more barley and prepare it for leavened bread. This bread is made in a much larger quantity, which is what the pit is for. 
a large amount of grain is poured, and the pit is mashed with a smooth rock into coarse flour. The flour is mixed with water and with leavened mother, a bit of pre-prepared leavened bread that has the necessary yeast inside of it. At this stage, the dough is also mixed with a secret recipe of aromatics, which can include a seemingly wide variety of fruit and spices that will affect the flavor of the final product. Ilsha Hagalu has already purchased a number of date fruits, along with the spice blend that her mother made her swear to never tell anyone but her own daughter someday, and these are all mashed up and tossed in the pit with the dough. The entire thing is then painstakingly stirred with a large stick for a very long time. But she doesn't do the stirring, at least not today. The baby is hungry, and A or B has sort of just been sitting there for a little while. He can take a turn stirring while she gets things ready for the next step. The dough, once it's fully stirred and ready, will be the beer bread. Many will make beer bread out of emmer or wheat or even millet up in the north, but this is barley-based beer bread, and barley is pretty much the primary ingredient. The dough will be baked in an oven. An improvised oven can easily be made out of a hole in the ground, though in the future she wants to make one from real bricks, as it's cleaner, hotter, and easier to work and control. With the beer bread ready, she now clears out her pit and repeats the process with her malted barley. The barley that's been germinating for the last three days is mashed into flour, mixed with water, and baked into more bread. This is called malt bread, though it isn't actually certain if the malt dough is cooked all the way into a bread, or if it's just cooked partially to be an incomplete dough. It may have been both in different places. All this bread is then taken and crumbled into pieces, then placed into the iconic pointed jars of beer making that the Sumerians invented. This is called the wort, or sweet wort, and I have no idea how it's made nowadays, but for the first beer makers, it was literally just breadcrumbs from two different breads, a wort bread and a normal leavened bread. Ilsha Hagalu has a few additional flavor items that she adds at this point, more fruits and spices. Water is then placed inside the jars and left to steep for a while. Now this part of the process appears to be a gap in modern knowledge of ancient beer making. Once the wort and water are mixed, we have something that Ilsha Hagalu would call beer. I mean, right away, there's, has it even fermented yet? It's mixed, as far as they're concerned, it's beer. At the bottom of the vat is a hole, currently plugged by a piece of wood. The longer that water and wort sits there, the more the properties of the beverage change. After some amount of steeping, the pointed jar with wort and water would be heated over a fire. How long it would be heated and how long it would be allowed to rest are family secrets and play a big role in flavor and the, in the ultimate alcohol content of the end product. Once the new beer was ready, the plug at the bottom of the vat would be pulled. The wort has settled at the bottom, so the water will press through the mashed wort at the bottom. Of course, a bunch of extra stuff, both wort and spare plant matter like hulls and chaff, would also fall into the jar that collected the contents of the cooking jar. So it is possible that a good amount of fermentation and infusion would continue in the storage jar. Meanwhile, Ilsha Hagalu can let the cooking jar cool down overnight, then add more water tomorrow, possibly adding an amount of extra wort, and use much of the leftover wort to make a few batches of beer in the coming days. The last batches would be the thinnest, most flavorless, but in a poor community you don't necessarily throw the wort away after a single use like some modern homebrewers might. The end result of all this is a whole bunch of jars with beer in them. This part of the brewing process is well known to everyone, and among high-end brewers, the storage would be done in well-seasoned, 
casks of wood. The longer the beer sits, the more Ninkasi is able to enchant it with the pleasure of beer. The people of Mesopotamia will drink beer all the way from zero alcohol sweet beer, perhaps only a day or two in the jar, all the way to thick beers with probably 4-5% to alcohol by volume, though most are probably 1-2% to alcohol. Some beer was thin, some beer was thick enough to chew, some was wheat, some was barley, some was flavored, none of it had hops which are considered essential for modern beer, and nearly all would have enough calories to make it a liquid meal all of its own, which was, of course, a main part of the beer's virtue. Some of this beer will be drunk at home, and even their three-year-old son will have some. And it seems that home brewing of some portion of the family's harvest was extremely common. After all, it can last a long time. But just as common is for the women of a household to make a large surplus of beer to sell. And this is Ilsha Hagalu's plan, to invest part of the year's harvest into a beer-selling enterprise. If her family recipe is a sweet beer, only a few weeks, or as little as a few days, could pass before the first jars are ready. If it's a stronger beer, then the family will be living around sealed beer jars for months to come. Either way, once things are ready, A or B takes some cloth and sticks into town and sets up a small stall. He pays a nominal fee to the owner of the neighboring house just to keep the peace and head off conflict while he sort of squats on this plot of land. And the next day, Ilsha Hagalu carries the first jar to the stall. A few people are curious about the family that had moved in the year previous, and they stop by long enough for Ilsha Hagalu to discuss how her great-great-grandmother had received a blessing from Ninkasi, the beer goddess, and ever since then the family had been blessed with delicious beer. A few men of the town are interested to test such a bold claim and promise to return later. As the sun is about to set, four men arrive with straws. They pay Ilsha Hagalu, then each one of them takes one of the four seats around the jar of beer. It isn't clear what the payment structure was. They weren't paying per cup, or mug, or pint, or whatever, because until fairly late in Mesopotamian history, only kings and wealthy folk drank out of cups. In the early centuries, even kings used straws. This is because Mesopotamian beer was almost undrinkable without filtering. But using a woven cloth just to filter beer wasn't invented right away, and even when it was, it was a great extravagance. For most people, they would use a straw, which served as both a filter and as a social status symbol. These straws are iconic and really kind of strange. Take a look at the episode's post up at oldeststories.net to get a sense of what beer drinking and straws looked like. Basically, a man would own a five-foot-long reed straw. Now, the bottom did not have one hole, but a number of small holes perforated around the side like a tube filter. It's hard to say just how thick they were, but surely those... Extra-thick milkshake straws are closer to the mark than normal plastic soda straws. All four men would stick their five-foot-tall straws into the jar together, and they would sit and chat and sip from the straws. After a time, one man might get up and another would pay and take his place. Such establishments could be single-jar affairs, like Ilsha Hagalu's, while larger ones may have had five or six jars for people to sit around. And it's possible that more than four seats were placed around the jars. We only see four in art, but Mesopotamian art's a bit limited with things like perspective. Though Ilsha Hagalu has more jars at home, she's only going to bring out one per night. The town is small, and it's better for her new business's reputation to have beer available more evenings rather than more beer per evening. The proprietors of drinking establishments like this could be men, 
but most often they were women. And often, it was an industry widows could get into if they had enough capital when their husbands died. Though in many ways, Ilsha Hagalo is under her husband's authority, she is an independent legal business person when acting as the mistress of a beer stand. The income she brings in is hers, and she can spend from that income either for herself or to grow the business. If there's a lawsuit, she might stand trial in her own right. If she wants to buy land, she can with this money. Aside from prostitution, beer selling is perhaps the most common way for women to act as legally and economically independent individuals. All that said, Ilsha Hagalu, like most ancient women, is content in her marriage and doesn't feel particularly oppressed, even if by modern standards she definitely is. As the beer stall grows more successful, she may occasionally buy herself a treat or a trinket, but the profits are for the household. And the stall does grow more successful. After that first evening, word spreads around town that Ilsha Hagalu's claim to being blessed by Ninkasi, the beer goddess, is true. She makes a delicious beverage, even if it's mostly barley. She doesn't go out every night, but she opens the stall often enough to be a reliable face in town. Though it's acceptable for a woman to run a beer stand, only the less reputable sort of woman would hang around one. So it's just her and a handful of men on these evenings. Around the beer jar, they throw sheep's knuckle bones like dice. They play the game of Ur with clay tokens on a board drawn on the ground. They gamble and sing and tell stories and lies. It isn't raucously loud. There isn't enough beer for anyone to get outrageously drunk. But it's noisy, happy, and warm. On this night, her husband, Arabi has come to the beer stall as a patron, bringing his five-foot-long reed straw all the way from the house. And the men sit around and wonder at how much better things were in the old days. They were it's generally agreed, at the very worst point of history. Things had fallen so far from where they had been and were likely never to recover again, is what they all complained as they sat and drank beer. And Arabi, having already had some beer at home before he came out to sit with the guys, began to sing a song. It was melodious and poetic in Akkadian and loses a lot in translation. But in English, the drinking song which he sang, in which he was joined by the men around him, goes something like this. Plans are made by Enki. Lots are drawn by the gods' will. From former days, only empty air remains. Whenever has anything been heard from those who went before? These kings were superior to those nowadays, and others to them before. Your eternal abode is above their homes. It's far away as heaven, whose hand can reach it. Like the depths of the earth, no one knows anything of it. The whole of a life is but the twinkling of an eye. The life of humankind is surely not forever. Where is King Alalu, who reigned for 36,000 years? Where is Itana, who went up to heaven? Where is Gilgamesh, who sought the life of Ziadsura? Where is Humbaba, who was seized and knocked to the ground? Where is Enkidu, who showed forth strength in the land? Where is King Bazi? Where is King Zizi? Where are the great kings from former days until now? They will not be born again. They will not be born again. And with that, Arabi and Ilshihagalu are tired after a long year of agricultural and domestic pursuits. I myself have not worked as hard as them, but researching ancient industry takes a bit longer than I was expecting. And so next week, next episode, both I and our hard-working family will get a rest. But what do ancient people do when they have downtime? They recite poems and tell tales. And since many of the tales are in poetic form to make them easier to memorize, well, those are basically the same thing. So join us next time as we look through a selection of ancient poems. 
I have a really long list of ones that I've wanted to read for the show that we never got around to, which is sort of what I do over on the TikTok. I do just the real short ones or just excerpts in less than three minutes. Uh, if you haven't checked out the oldest stories TikTok, it's one word, oldest stories. I don't actually know how you look things up on TikTok, but uh, I do readings and um, facts of the day, little things like that. It only takes me like 10 minutes to pop one out, so it's uh, real great for fact of the day stuff. Anyway, whether you like TikTok or you are civilized, you can look forward to the fact that after we have this story time for the next uh, maybe two episodes, we'll get back to the industrial episodes to look at textiles and metalworking, and maybe one or two other things if I can get enough sources for them. Thank you for listening.